Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. The Asian Conference extends a warm welcome to all our guests at today's lecture entitled Best River Basin Management Strategies, Perspectives and Policies with Reference to the GBM Basin. Headquartered in Shillong, Meghalaya, the Asian Conference works on a vision for a stable and prosperous Asia where ecology is honored, diversity is celebrated, prosperity is shared, sovereignty is respected, and boundaries become connectors. The natural allies in development and interdependence, or the Nadi Conversations, is a flagship <laughs> initiative which primarily focuses on the Ganga Brahmaputra Meghna Basin and the platform further ideates in dealing with specific cases of cross-learning between South and Southeast Asia with sharing from the other river basins. Our effort has been to integrate, converge and connect ideas and gather ground up instances to factor in the sustainability aspect through conversations and lectures by experts, practitioners and relevant stakeholders from various disciplines. Our guest for the afternoon is Professor Vinod Tare from IIT Kanpur and he would be sharing his perspective on the river basin management strategies that have been adopted in the GBM basin. River basin management policies, while being flexible, have to be attuned to the needs of the basin itself and the lives associated with it. And the formulation of these policies are required to be flexible and technically sound to suit the needs of the basins and the lives which, are, which have been connected with them. Dr. Vinod Tare is the Professor of Environmental Engineering and Management at the prestigious Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur, and he's a civil engineer who has obtained his master's and doctoral degrees from Environmental Engineering from IIT Kanpur and did his postdoctoral research from the Illinois Institute of Technology, Chicago. Dr. Tare was the leader of the consortia of seven IITs for the preparation of the Ganga River Basin Management Plan and the founding head for the Center for Ganga River Basin Management Studies at IIT Kanpur, which is supported by the Ministry of Jal Shakti, Government of India. He has encouraged and guided numerous masters and doctoral dissertations and published many reports and papers in conference proceedings and journals of international repute. We welcome you, sir, and thank you so much for joining us today. Our Executive Director, Mr. Sabisachi Datta, would be joining us at this afternoon as the moderator for this lecture. Now I would like to hand over the floor to our Director. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Atri, and uh, a very warm welcome to you, Professor Tare. Uh, you are a very well-known authority on the uh, uh, on the GBM basin, on water management, uh, basin management, as it were, in, in, in general. And your work in the Sea Ganga is, I mean, absolutely, you know, we, we know uh, all about it. Uh, and we are really, really honored and, uh, you know, pleased to have you. And may I say it's my personal honor to welcome you to this lecture. Thank you for your time to uh, to come on board uh, and address uh, Asian Confluence as part of these Nadi conversation series. Um, I don't want to be uh, between the audience and, the, and you too much, but just to say that uh, in today's context, um, uh, basin management uh, strategies, uh, perspectives and policies with specific reference to the GBM basin, um, it has repercussions uh, and so many dimensions um, uh, at a local level, uh, at a regional level, at a state level, um, uh, and at international level. Uh, a lot of it, uh, a lot of our relations with our, our neighboring countries uh, uh, and, and the future of it also depends on how well we uh, work on our uh, shared riverine heritage, uh, namely in the Ganga, uh, Brahmaputra, Meghna uh, basin as it were. And I think uh, the topic of this um, this lecture today is uh, very, very timely. And uh, I won't take much longer, but just to say that we are all looking forward to your lecture. So thank you again, and over to you, Professor Tare. Namaskar. Uh, thank you for that nice introduction and the good word. Uh, it's really my pleasure uh, to be talking about 
uh, on a topic uh, which is really very dear to me. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me uh, this opportunity. Uh, I would be uh, talking about the river basin management uh, strategies, um, uh, perspectives and policies uh, with respect to, with reference to the work uh, that uh, the consortium of IIT and subsequently Sea Ganga uh, has been doing uh, in terms of uh, Ganga River Basin Management Plan. Uh, the first version of the Ganga River Basin Management Plan was submitted to the government of India in 2015. And since then, uh, we have been uh, following it up and developing it further. As I will illustrate, uh, the river basin management plan is not a one-time activity. It is actually a continuous activity. It's a dynamic activity. And uh, it has to probably go on as long as we want a river like Ganga or any such river to flow. So the, our efforts uh, for restoration and conservation has to go on as long as we want that the rivers should continue to flow. And there is a reason why we would like uh, that the river should flow. If, if the rivers stop flowing, uh, essentially the civilizations will also stop flowing. Okay, so if you want uh, civilizations uh, to prosper, uh, to sustain, to continue, uh, it is equally important that we ensure that the rivers continue to flow and we keep on uh, working on restoration and conservation of uh, rivers. So restoration and conservation of rivers is, is a long term and ongoing activity. It's not a one-time activity. It has to go on uh, uh, as long as, as I said, uh, we would like uh, civilizations to go on and the rivers to flow. Okay. Uh, when we look at uh, studying or planning, okay, it is important to look at the natural boundaries because nature does not uh, recognize uh, countries, does not recognize states, uh, districts or whatever. Uh, the, color, the, the nature works with its own boundaries. So when we want to really make plan, uh, study, it is important to look at the natural boundaries. However, however, uh, when it comes to implementation part, we all know we have the constraints of administrative boundaries. So for uh, implementation purposes or for actions, uh, we always work with administrative boundaries uh, starting from nation to states to districts uh, and, and so on and so forth. And this uh, we need to recognize that for study purposes and planning purposes, we need to use the natural boundaries, but for actions, we need to delineate that plan in terms of uh, administrative boundaries. And as I said, planning and implementation is, is a dynamic process, is a cyclic process, okay? And probably has to go on uh, on a, a continuous, continuous basis. Uh, as we learn more and more about nature, as we understand more and more about rivers, uh, and we take actions on the ground, uh, based on the results of those actions on the ground, uh, it gives us the feedback, we learn more things, and that has to be continuously incorporated uh, into our uh, study pr uh, process and also uh, in the implementation process. So, as I said, uh, river regeneration and conservation is, is a very, is a cyclic process. And when we deal with nature, when we deal with water, when we deal with river, uh, obviously there are diverse uh, stakeholders' uh, interests are involved. And when you have diverse interests involved, uh, if you want to go ahead, it is very important 
to come to the table and negotiate. Okay. So the first three steps in a river basin management plan cycle is to understand and then to communicate that understanding to the diverse uh, group of people, diverse stakeholders. Only then the negotiations on a table become meaningful. But invariably, invariably, these three important steps uh, are something we give low priority. We give low priority. And invariably, our way of operation is uh, when it comes to any project or for river restoration and conservation, uh, uh, Ganga River not excluded. Okay, uh, we, we, When we see the river in a very, very desperate situation, uh, we start uh, taking ad hoc actions. Okay, we allocate certain resources, and based on those resources, limitations of the resources, we design a project and start uh, implementing that. Okay, and then uh, we, we uh, kind of uh, put in uh, regulations, uh, provide incentives. Uh, and, and so on, and start governing. Okay, but invariably that does not give us uh, the right kind of results. Okay, uh, and uh, we need to, of course, uh, monitor, watch what is the outcome of our reaction. Uh, that is in terms of monitoring and feedback. And once we get that monitoring and feedback, uh, that increases our understanding, and that understanding need to be communicated to. Uh, the various stakeholders and unless until we negotiate uh, uh, we will not be able to move further. So it's very important to understand this river reservation and conservation uh, process uh, which is a cyclic process and I would like to emphasize again that understanding communication and negotiations are the most important part uh, of this uh, most important steps of this uh, planning process which we invariably ignore and that's the reason why on the ground we do not uh, see the results, results uh, as effective as we would like to uh, see them. It's also important <coughs> to uh, have certain guiding principles when we are talking about uh, river uh, conservation and restoration. Okay. It is important to apply modern science and use new technologies. But it is equally important that we should apply the modern science and new technologies with traditional wisdom and knowledge. And this has been our prime driver while preparing Ganga River Basin Management Plan and also uh, doing advocacy uh, with the government. Okay. So it's important to have uh, Gyanadhara, that is the public knowledge, the public wisdom, uh, along with uh, scientific knowledge, that is Gyanadhara and the Janadnyan, that is the knowledge which is available uh, traditionally uh, with people. Okay. And uh, uh, it is important to assess the appropriateness of uh, the technology or the new solutions that we bring in. And that typically comes with traditional knowledge. And that is where traditional knowledge is very important. Wherever a new uh, solution, new technology or new way of uh, looking at things comes in, uh, we always need to use uh, that traditional knowledge with us. Uh, of course, the modern science uh, can assist us, modern new technologies can assist us in increasing the efficiency, increasing the productivity. So both are very equal, uh, important and both have to be uh, balanced, uh, traditional knowledge with modern science. And I'll illustrate some of the examples uh, on, on this. Uh, typically, when we look at uh, origin of any river, uh, Ganga River, of course, uh, is 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 uh, the most important one that we are talking about. 
okay typically all rivers originate at high altitude okay and uh, if you look at any uh, fairly reasonably large uh, river and river basin uh, it can be typically divided into uh, three or four uh, major segment what we call it as the original uh, the origin segment uh, which is typically a mountainous stretch and then river enters into the plain so we have uh, the upper plains uh, the middle plains and the lower plains and finally the river goes and meets the ocean uh, uh, with uh, deltaic region okay so it is important to understand this uh, different segments of the river basin and uh, uh, if we look at uh, about ganga particularly we have the uh, mythological stories that when ganga uh, agreed uh, to come down on the earth okay uh, uh, it was expected that the momentum that the she would have is so high that it would kind of destroy and so some kind of arrest mechanism uh, was required and that is where we have the story which says that the lord shankar uh, locked uh, the flow uh, into uh, his uh, uh, lords and then uh, it gradually flew okay what does it mean this also actually means typically in the mountainous stretch uh, in the mountainous region uh, we will have high elevation there are steep slopes and also many times there is rocky terrain there okay and when the rainfall occurs uh, uh, obviously whatever the surface runoff is it flows very rapidly okay and ends up eroding uh, many many things okay and it is important to to arrest that flow and that is where the forest that we have the trees that we have the vegetation that we have uh, in in that region uh, helps in arresting not only that if you would like to have uh, the rivers to be perennial because rainfall particularly under indian condition we all know that the rainfall is for a very short duration uh, maybe out of 365 days uh, typically we have rains uh, for probably 30 40 days or so okay now rest of the period there is no rainfall or even snowfall for that matter okay in that case how the river becomes perennial how the river becomes perennial and this is where the importance of uh, water percolating down uh, in the reservoirs below the trees uh, by the trees uh, is is very important and in terms of water resource management what i would like to say is uh, it actually helps in converting rapid flow into a sluggish flow okay and that's the most important aspect uh, if you want to make sure that the rivers uh, remain uh, perennial as much as we can make sure that the vegetation the plantation the forest uh, is preserved uh, in the upper catchment okay and when we talk about river origin river does not origin uh, particular like river ganga uh, only at one place in fact uh, we, we we always say uh, that ganga has three main head streams uh, bhagirathi alaknanda and mandakini the one uh, which is coming after touching the uh, feet of vishnu okay another is uh, the one which is released from shankar chatta that is through kedarnath uh, mandakini and uh, the third one is the bhagirathi uh, which comes from gangotri uh, probably from brahmas kamandanu okay so that is a very symbolic thing for us but if you look at uh, the larger picture scientific picture of river ganga okay it has thousands of origins okay from uh, various parts of its basin starting from southern part uh, southwestern part of the basin let's say uh, we talk about river small river there khan uh, which gets into uh, shipra shipra gets into chambal chambal gets into yamuna and yamuna gets into uh, ganga so that is also 
uh, one of the origins. Oh, so Chambal is an origin of uh, Ganga, uh, Khan is an origin of river Ganga and like that several several rivers we can consider it as the origins of river or Ganga can be considered uh, to be made of uh, thousands of uh, streams and it's very important to recognize that. So this uh, has been told to us uh, by the traditional uh, mythological stories what is the importance of uh, forest? What is the importance of predicting uh, catchment area, uh, having appropriate vegetation, and how actually that helps uh, in, in making sure that the rapid flow, the destruction is, is arrested, is controlled. And not only that, the water that makes that is available uh, through rain or snow is made to flow throughout the year and that is what makes the river perennial and we should not uh, have any action which actually disturbs this uh, kind of mechanism and if we disturb this mechanism uh, obviously uh, the rivers are going to dry up and this is what we also see in many places okay and so one of the important aspects uh, that uh, is required when we talk about river conservation uh, and restoration uh, and the flows to be maintained in the river is also to ensure that the catchment area, the entire basin uh, catchment is, is uh, ecologically uh, protected. Okay. And it is not just uh, the question of releasing some flow from here and there that we will be able to make uh, the thing. Okay, so the entire basin actually contributes uh, into uh, the flow regime uh, of a particular river, and it's very important to understand uh, that. <coughs> uh, another example that I will give. Okay, uh, unless until uh, we, we we have people connect uh, in the uh, river restoration and conservation, uh, it is difficult uh, to think of uh, river regeneration programs okay and it is important to give that much importance to the river and uh, what else uh, can tell us uh, about the importance of the river other than uh, what has been said in uh, Bhagavad Gita by Lord uh, Krishna Pavanaha Pauta Masmi Ramaha Shastra Bhruta Maham Jashanam Makarashchasmi Strotasama Asmi Janavi. In describing various forms, uh, the Lord is saying, I am Ganga. And when we talk about Ganga, Ganga is not just a biophysical entity which probably originates from Himalaya and goes and meets Ganga Sagar. Ganga is a culture of Indian rivers and not only Indian rivers, uh, probably all rivers of, of this region. So when I say Ganga or when we talk about Ganga, Ganga actually means all rivers for us. Ganga is synonym uh, for the river for us. So it's not just biophysical entity. And in fact, if you look at our way of uh, living, no matter where I'm taking my bath, uh, in my bathroom or I'm taking bath in Narmada or I'm taking bath in Kar uh, Kaveri or Godavari or any pond for that matter, uh, I always pronounce Hara Hara Gange. Okay. And that means Ganga means all rivers for us. And it's very important to understand that. And that's the kind of importance that we give. Anything that we see as God, we obviously will respect. So that's the connect uh, that Bhagavad Gita uh, allows us uh, with rivers. And it, that's why I, I thought it is important to bring it. Also, there is traditional knowledge always uh, available to us. So this stroke is, is a compilation of uh, the, the teachings that are given in Brahmand Purana. And what is said there? Gangam Punnajalam Prapya Chaturudasha Vivarjayat. There are 14 actions which are prohibited uh, when we look at a river or Ganga particularly. Okay. And what are those actions? Shaucham, Achamanam, Kesham, Nirmalyam, 
Malagarshanam. So all these activities are actually prohibited. Gatra Saumanam, flowing of uh, dead bodies, uh, Krida, uh, Pratigraham, Athoratim, Anyatirtha Ratinchayo, Anyatirtha Prasansanam, Vastatyagam, that is leaving your garments, okay, or uh, uh, making all kinds of noises uh, at certain sacred places uh, close to the river. So these are the actions which we have been told uh, are prohibited. Uh, in my opinion, no standard environmental standard of modern days of today can actually describe what we should not be doing uh, with river in such a condensed, such a comprehensive and such a communicable way uh, of obtaining. And this is where we need to make sure uh, that this we use it effectively. Our ancestors have used it very effectively. And that is how uh, the people's faith is connected with the river. Because if the rivers are protected, as I said, uh, civilizations will, will, will continue. Uh, another important teaching that comes from the traditional knowledge, uh, the, the ancient literature, uh, is about uh, Narmada, Saraswati, uh, Ganga, and uh, this shlok says, Tribhi Saraswatam Toyam, Saptahena Tu Yamunam, Satya Punati Gangeya, Darshana Deva Narmada. What does it mean? It means uh, that if you take deep for three days in Saraswati, for one week in Yamuna, and only one deep in Ganga, okay, can clean all your scenes. But so far as Narmada is concerned, even just the saluting Narmada or darshan of Narmada from a distance will, will, will do the same job. Now here, idea is not that we would like to compare one river with another. Are trying to say one river is superior over other because with one river only darshan can uh, do the same job as uh, a deep in another river. The idea is that each river has its own setting, okay, geological setting, biological setting, okay, and there are certain precautions that need to be observed with respect to the river. What we do with Ganga or Yamuna uh, should not be done with Narmada. So taking deep uh, or bath in Narmada is probably not good for human being and also not as much good for the river itself. Okay, And that's the kind of message uh, through this shlok uh, is given to common people. Okay, That what kind of behavior we should have with different kind of rivers. Okay, And like that Many such literature, ancient literature, will tell us what should be our behavior with, with various kind of rivers. And this is what I mean that when we look at uh, the modern science and technology, okay, uh, we must make sure its appropriateness vis a vis the traditional wisdom or the knowledge uh, that is available to us. Okay, and it's very important rivers can be conserved not just by using modern science technologies, but the faith of the people, the connect of the people, and also uh, understanding and negotiating with people uh, of various diverse groups is, is a very important aspect and that's what I want to stress. Uh, it cannot be a government program. It cannot be by the government. It cannot be just allocating certain resources or making some STPs here and there or releasing some environmental, in the name of environmental flows, certain discharges or whatever. It's this much larger picture uh, that one has to see. And that is possible only when uh, we make sure that we, we, we uh, use our traditional wisdom uh, and of course, enhance our productivity and efficiency with the use of uh, the latest uh, developments, technologies uh, that we have with us, uh, which are available, be it remote sensing, be it satellite, uh, imaginary or whatever uh, that is available to us. So when we look at river, ultimately it's a water body. Okay. And any water and water body has a biophysical dimension. 
which can be probably described uh, in terms of quantity and and uh, the quality in terms of uh, many dimensions the geomorphological dimension be it uh, biological profile dimension be it uh, uh, hydrological characteristics or hydraulic uh, description of uh, the channel and so on and so forth so it has a biophysical dimension but uh, there are other important dimensions uh, when we want to look at river restoration and conservation uh, that is the social dimension the cultural and spiritual dimension uh, and of course the associated livelihood with that uh, which we can look at it as economic dimension and and of course uh, when you have so many dimensions the politics cannot be away from it and so there is political dimension and as a river basin uh, manager uh, you need to understand our uh, these all these dimensions very well and and uh, look at uh, how uh, people will react to it and how changes will take place okay and uh, of course water is one of the most uh, important component of the overall thing and scientifically uh, obviously uh, we talk more about water in terms of uh, river or water bodies but there are other dimensions so uh, the technical tool, tool that we use uh, to understand about water is we are talking about water audit and, and water budget and we are, we are developing this subject so this helps us uh, in, in managing our resources uh, but uh, it is important that the other dimensions uh, are given uh, due respect and due importance <coughs> when it comes to river river is a body like human being so uh, river also has a body and that body can be looked at as the entire basin okay and uh, the entire basin like body parts are connected with each other through several organs and organ systems so also the river basin is connected with each other uh, through various mechanisms okay and it is important uh, to understand that connection uh, and how uh, one affects each other so when we are looking at river basin management plan and for each basin uh, there is a different dimension of uh, many connections that we have groundwater surface water uh, so scientifically when i want to make a plan obviously uh, we need to make sure that we, we understand uh, various aspects within the limitations of uh, human being so when we are talking about uh, restoration of river ganga or in general uh, as i said ganga to me means any river are all rivers okay and invariably uh, the main day mandate that we should put to ourselves is is the restoration of the wholesomeness uh, of all rivers in a particular basin now it's difficult to uh, kind of understand or describe what does wholesome means but uh, within our capabilities we can say wholesomeness means uh, the continuous flow uh, of the river that's what we call it as uh, aviralta or aviraldhara uh, it is also important that whatever flows uh, has uh, suitable quality okay that is what we call it as uh, nirmal flow or nirmal dhara okay that is uh, the quality should not be deteriorated uh, with anthropogenic actions uh, beyond a limit uh, and that uh, uh, we have to understand that in the river uh, we are not the only users but there are different kinds of life forms which are part and parcel of the river so the water or uh, whatever that flows into the river uh, has to have a quality which is acceptable uh, to to all kinds of life forms and one has to also recognize that the rivers are not made by us they are made by uh, thousands of years of geologic processes so river has to be recognized as a geological entity and it is also an ecological entity 
<coughs> consisting of a biotic, biotic component as well as a, a biotic component and they are uh, together needs to be considered. So that is what uh, in general uh, from the Ganga River Basin Management Plan studies uh, we could understand that uh, if you want to restore this river, uh, river restoration means restoring the wholesomeness of the river and uh, in the context of uh, river basin management plan, we can look at river as uh, an ecological entity, geological entity that has to flow uh, and the quality of the flow uh, has to be commensurate with the requirement of the indigenous flora and fauna uh, that uh, is part of the river system. And that is what uh, we kept that as a vision and I guess uh, that should be the reason for uh, restoration and conservation of any river that it has to have a Viraldhara, Nirmaldhara, geological entity, ecological entity and uh, in order to put our actions together we can think of uh, organizing ourselves uh, in terms of uh, different uh, groups of activity the one which is responsible for ensuring the Viralta river uh, Nirmalta of the river, uh, ecological uh, restoration um, and associated activities which influence the river uh, like uh, agriculture is one of the most important activities that influences. So all these things we can look at it in the form of a mission mode and if you want to restore river probably all these missions have to be executed uh, simultaneously and on a continuous basis okay only then uh, we probably will be able to make sure that the rivers <coughs> are restored conserved and there is interest for us because as long as rivers flow uh, the civilization will flow uh, the human beings will get uh, benefited the river will continue to uh, carry out its functions and its processes. This is what you say. The functions and the processes that the rivers carry out carry out are are very very beneficial. And if any of those functions or processes are lost, okay, uh, we may not be able to see the effect in a short term. But in a long term, uh, it becomes uh, very very uh, high consequence of high consequence. And invariably. Uh, the river uh, functions are uh, processes uh, are, are uh, degraded, are, are, are arrested, are uh, stopped uh, because of mostly man-made actions. And these man-made actions uh, can be grouped into five uh, major types of degradation factors uh, which are listed here. And these essentially happen because of the major human activities affecting the aquatic environment of uh, the river basin, uh, whether it is uh, uh, agriculture uh, activities, uh, whether it is uh, degradation or denudation of forests and so on and so forth. Okay, so overuse of natural resources uh, and this is all uh, human activities. So if we talk about river restoration and conservation, it is essentially uh, the human beings have to manage uh, these activities which are responsible for uh, five major uh, types of degradation uh, factors. And these, uh, if we do not uh, take care of it, uh, essentially results in loss of ecosystem services uh, which we try to classify in terms of uh, provisioning services uh, regulatory services, uh, the supporting services and cultural services and all of these services are very very important uh, from the point of view of uh, civilization and that is the main driving force why we should make sure that the rivers are uh, protected. Now if you want to protect rivers uh, you have to have some kind of uh, communicable mechanism uh, with the people, how important the rivers are. And, and uh, this is a very, very powerful 
phrase that uh, our prime minister uh, has given us during the first ganga council meeting uh, what is referred to as earth ganga earth ganga actually uh, does not refer uh, to earth as economic aspects only earth is trying to understand the holistic the comprehensive value of of the river including economic uh, aspects <coughs> of it and ganga here as i said does not mean only the biophysical entity in the form of ganga that we know ganga actually represents uh, all rivers okay so earth ganga has a much larger meaning and is applicable for uh, all rivers okay and it's a very powerful uh, communication tool which common people can uh, understand uh, uh, invariably so far uh, when we look at river conservation uh, and development they are seen as two different uh, opposing sides okay uh, uh, one uh, group of people uh, stakeholders uh, arguing for the uh, restoration and conservation of rivers uh, and obviously they are more uh, faith leaders the civil society organization and they understand the value of the rivers water from a long term perspective so they typically argue uh, based on the uh, high uh, traditional knowledge and wisdom uh, from the long term perspective on the other hand uh, we we have people who who represent development so called uh, they essentially uh, base their arguments on the modern science and technology solutions okay but their perspective is more a short term maybe five year planning period or 10 year planning period or so but rivers have a much longer lifetime and that is where we need to make sure that rather than then these two are seen as two contradictory or opposing views uh, can we have these two as the uh, two sides of uh, a coin <coughs> and that is what is the meaning of uh, earth ganga is river conservation and development to be seen as two sides or two faces of a coin and they cannot be separated from each other both have to go together because even river conservation and restoration requires large amount of resources and one cannot put that much resources unless there is economic activity unless there is development unless there is a livelihood of the people associated with it okay so they have to go hand in hand together so river conservation cannot happen without developmental activities and development cannot happen uh, in a sustainable way unless the natural resources river particularly is is protected so they have to be seen as two sides of of a single coin and that's the basic uh, motive behind talking about earth ganga okay and uh, if you really want to implement the spirit of uh, earth ganga uh, as i said uh, the guiding principle has to apply modern science and technology uh, but with traditional wisdom uh, <coughs> also uh, we have to think globally on a basin scale but actions have to be uh, start actions have to start uh, locally so every local community is responsible uh, are, uh, for uh, making sure their part of the river stretch or segment of the basin is 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 uh, maintained is conserved okay and it's also important to talk about uh, the vasudeva kutumbam one family and not family only of the human beings but all life forms at the same time uh, it is important that we initiate action from ourselves from our family our community our locality uh, city state and country so in terms of action okay so concept point is is open it is uh, important to have this concept of uh, unified family vasudeva uh, kutumbakam but uh, in terms of uh, our responsibilities it can initiate start from uh, uh, individual to family to community and so on. so these are very very important thing <coughs> 
And when we talk about Earth Ganga concept and plan for local rivers, okay, so start from a small river uh, in a river basin and uh, make sure that your developmental activities are centered around uh, river conservation. So the focus has to be uh, multi-purpose use of water bodies and develop river synchronized economy. And then, of course, there can be several sectors of economy. Uh, of course, in the Ganga River Basin Management Plan and in Sea Ganga, uh, that is what we are now trying to kind of lay out uh, what or how do we roll out this concept of Earth Ganga. That is, we have rivers protected at the same time, uh, our tourism goes on, uh, navigation happens, uh, the energy requirements are met, uh, agriculture and fishery is sustained, uh, the industries are sustained, the forestry uh, and the associated economic activities with that happen. And all that cannot happen unless until we have sound education and uh, culture uh, with us. And that only and of course uh, there are programs that are required and this is what we have uh, in the form of Jal Jeevan Mission or Navami Gange uh, but the spirit of river conservation uh, has to be kept uh, at the uh, focus at the nucleus or at the center uh, while we plan uh, all other activities in a balanced way. So, uh, in order to implement the concept of Earth Ganga, uh, there are several uh, components which we have kind of categorized as principal components which involve uh, understanding about river health, uh, about river monitoring and the concepts of circular economy uh, which we can talk in terms of being vocal for local, uh, close the loop at the local level as much as possible, okay, on a geographical scale, the loop can be closed for various factors at different geographical scale. So whatever is the shortest uh, possible loop, uh, space at which we can uh, close that particular factor, uh, that's the concept of circular economy. Of course, all this can happen only when we have enabling component that is understanding. So the data and information is very important. Uh, bringing in new technologies, innovations, novel and novel practices, uh, all that are very, very uh, important. And developing economics, finance, investment, uh, tools and techniques, okay? And all that understanding has to be communicated. And that's why the third, the most important component is the engagement component. Uh, advocacy, outreach, and stakeholder engagement and management and that only together can deliver us on uh, what uh, we would like to achieve uh, through uh, Earth Ganga concept. Of course, we require science, technology and engineering. We require appropriate policies and laws, uh, governance mechanism and uh, instruments. Uh, economics, finance, and investment. So when I talk about Ganga Basin or River Basin Management, uh, all these aspects have to be, it is not just science and technology, but all these aspects are, 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 are very, very important. And finally, what do we want to deliver? Okay. Uh, so if you ask me, what should be the goal of a River Basin uh, Management uh, plan, okay, and that's what I say. Uh, we would like to make sure that the capability of the rivers, which we call it a samarth, uh, samarth uh, of the river, uh, samarth Ganga. That means the samarth of all rivers uh, is is maintained, and that's our responsibility. If you make sure that the rivers' capabilities are retain okay then river will continue to deliver uh, to us uh, the processes and uh, functions uh, which we are so much dependent on okay so the goal of a river basin management plan is basically to ensure samarth ganga that is each river's samarth is is restored obviously uh, the samarth of each river in different segments at different locations and different places is is different so that has to be understood and it is the responsibility of river basin manager to ensure that that samarth 
is 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 retained and that can be retained only when we construct these five important pillars what are those important pillars one is the nirmal ganga and abhiral ganga i'm sure we all understand what nirmal ganga and abhiral ganga but it is very important to understand that the nirmalta and abhiralta concept uh, is different for different rivers at different locations i am not going to talk about uniform water quality from gangotri to ganga sagar or everywhere in the river right so nirmalta has to be shaken from the point of from the context of uh, the local uh, quality of the flow that you have and similarly the concept of uh, abhiralta uh, has to be seen uh, from the perspective of each river and we can only achieve abhiralta and nirmalta uh, provided we use appropriate knowledge and that's where gana ganga is very important so understanding river science and management is is very very important so that's an important pillar and connect of the people and that is what we call it as jana ganga so if you develop the two outer pillar this side and the two outer pillar uh, other side right side uh, only then we can construct the middle pier that is what is called as earth ganga which is river conservation synchronized development and we have to make sure that all these pillars are raised continuously and supported continuously so that rivers capabilities are are retained and that then will allow us to uh, make sure that whatever benefits that we get from the natural functions that the and the processes that the rivers carry out uh, we we do get the benefit of that and that is what in true spirit is the uh, river conservation and restoration means okay now typically uh, when we look at the river basin management plan we always look at it uh, from the top order river like in case of ganga basin ganga happens to be the uh, highest order river in the ganga basin okay but for strategic plan probably that's okay but if i want to implement that or prepare a more micro level plan uh, then it is important to start building the pyramid base and then start building the right pyramid and this is what uh, in the next version or uh, which i said is a dynamic continuous uh, thing uh, is is we need to do for any river we need to make sure that Uh, all lower order rivers uh, are 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 taken care of then higher order river will automatically be constructed okay and uh, in order to study this uh, we of course have to consider the natural boundaries which we look at continent subcontinent basin sub basin river and uh, finally going down to the tributary and on the right side uh, what you see is an example of that as part of ganga basin shipra basin is a part of ganga basin uh, which is shipra river and then uh, shipra river itself may have some other small tributaries like khan and so on so forth so if i want to work i need to start from all lower order rivers if you start making lower order rivers a uh, wide uh, base of the pyramid uh, the the top will automatically uh, be built but in terms of implementation uh, we 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 divide our actions in terms of administrative boundaries so both uh, natural boundaries and administrative boundaries uh, with different purposes have to be understood properly and finally when we look at the water quality management uh, mostly it is our waste Uh, which uh, uh, actually alter the water quality uh, that flows into the rivers or is part of the water bodies <coughs> it is important that we uh, utilize the natural capacity and the man made systems in a very very optimal way and that is where uh, we have introduced the concept of what we call it as four layer uh, kind of water quality alteration uh, of the waste water and then uh, making sure that the uh, rivers uh, are are maintained using uh, the treated uh, water 
and both natural capacity and the uh, electromechanical capacity is optimally used and it is in this context we are always arguing for variable uh, standards uh, for managing uh, the the sewage treatment waste treatment or industrial treatment or solid waste management or whatever which has a great impact on the quality of the flow so that is one thing and as an example we have uh, a, a set up a very simple pilot uh, which can even be used in household uh, uh, activity and it does not really uh, look like a uh, sewage treatment plant but uh, you can make sure that uh, your household wastewater uh, is utilized uh, to ensure that river. So this is an example. We have set up a pilot uh, wherein uh, we have a combination of uh, man-made uh, treatment process, aeration process, as well as the natural. What you see outside is a nature-based treatment. And finally, we also have a simulated river wherein the aquatic life can there. So this particular thing is fed only with sewage and from sewage we can create. So there are examples in a very simple way, in a very de decentralized way, you can ensure that uh, the sewage from rural setting or uh, decentralized locations uh, can be managed properly. And the idea is indigenous aquatic life in all our water bodies or natural uh, streams uh, is, is maintained. So that should be our, our ultimate goal uh, of uh, river restoration and uh, conservation. Okay. Uh, finally, the last but the, not the least important, uh, as I said, uh, I started with that negotiations are very important. And in any river, uh, we will have a number of diverse group of uh, stakeholders. Uh, starting from uh, politicians to administrators to technocrats to, to academics uh, and researchers okay and all these category of people professionals uh, have their affiliation with uh, various different kinds of agencies be it central government agency or state government agencies or local government and depending upon which agency or which part they represent the same knowledge they take it and they use it in a different way uh, to argue their point of view and the real challenge lies how do i align the interest of all the stakeholders and the only way that you can do is if you create evidences if you keep no under, have understanding and that alone can bring everybody onto the table and we can have uh, effective negotiation. And only through that, uh, we will be in a position to uh, monitor, uh, to, to make sure that the rivers are restored and conserved. Uh, obviously, we need to use all possible tools and technique. Uh, you have to have motivation and that is where I use uh, the, the traditional knowledge or coding. Uh, from the ancient literature. Uh, we need to use uh, the modern science and technology uh, that is important. So as and when we progress, we use effectively to ensure that the efficiency increases, the productivity increases, but appropriateness of any solution is not lost. And uh, finally, obviously, I need to have uh, resources, physical, uh, cash or kind, and that also has to be managed. So if you do all that together, then rivers can be managed. Uh, of course, uh, we have good policies and programs of the government, and I hope uh, we will be able to uh, utilize that uh, very effectively. And in times to come, we will see our river systems uh, much differently. Uh, people will view that in a very, very different uh, way. So with this, uh, I would like to close. Uh, uh, we have a detailed uh, uh, reporting of whatever studies that we have done as part of Ganga River Basin Management Plan. Uh, they are available in, in number of reports. 
typically they are in three different layers as you can see the the top layer is the comprehensive uh, management plan which is give, described in brief uh, followed by the uh, the the mission reports the eight missions that i mentioned about and these mission reports have been derived based on several thematic uh, reports uh, studies on various kinds of topics and subjects and this is what we need to do uh, typically for any river uh, basin management uh, strategy preparation uh, and developing perspectives on what should be done so thank you very much uh, if there are uh, questions or comments uh, i'll be too happy to uh, explain that uh, and uh, you can do that now if there is a provision or uh, we can send you can send it to me uh, through mails thank you very much thank you professor tare thank you uh, i uh, we it was a fascinating lecture thank you very much for that and uh, i can't uh, we are running out of time but i can't uh, uh, not uh, have this opportunity to ask you one question um, at least and i'd request uh, our viewers also to send in their <coughs> questions if we can email to you and uh, uh, my question uh, uh, dr tare is that uh, you know uh, the the uh, the value behind the basin approach uh, is is well uh, as you so wonderfully explained uh, is is well uh, well illustrated uh, now when it comes to uh, transboundary rivers uh, like uh, like ganga or brahmaputra for that matter in the gbm uh, should we do you think it is time now that we approach uh, we adopt a Uh, a basin approach to um, managing these rivers also with our uh, neighboring countries uh, that we have some kind of a uh, a management structure where both countries on two sides of the border uh, but on of the same river uh, which is flowing across knowing no political boundaries um, adopt a similar basin approach so that the river uh, conservation efforts can go much better synchronized there is there is i don't think there is any doubt uh, that we should uh, not follow the river basin approach okay so when we say the river uh, river does not recognize as i said in the beginning itself uh, nature does not recognize any administrative boundaries okay so for planning studies understanding uh, we cannot do without considering the entire basin that's very important but as you also said there are diverse group of uh, stakeholders that are involved okay uh, starting from various countries in a case like ganga uh, basin we have uh, multiple countries whose, whose stakes are involved now how do we bring them all together on on a table for negotiation and this is where i said the only way as i said these three aspects we invariably neglect understanding communicating that understanding and negotiating with the concerned people and unless until we do that okay and proper negotiation can take place only when we are transparent when we understand things properly and communicate that understanding and i guess that is where we need to work a lot on okay because each one of us depending upon which agency which country which geographical location that we belong to the same scientific information we try to present in our own perspective okay uh, but science is only one right and that is where we need to make sure that all scientific evidence and that's the responsibility of scientific community that we make sure that the knowledge is made available is made as transparent as possible we have good evidences of the thing and i'm sure uh, if the evidences are there no matter how much you want to argue for myself uh, i cannot really uh, ignore uh, the evidence and that's the only key in my opinion uh, to solve or resolve uh, such kind of issues thank you i think so what you're saying is more interactions Uh, yes. with scientists between scientists <laughs> between the various stakeholders um, yes. i think uh, yes and uh, you know on that note um, you will be happy to know that uh, 
the Asian Confluence uh, has been organizing some uh, and will continue to organize some uh, some key um, uh, uh, forums where uh, scientists, policymakers, communities um, uh, across borders can actually come together and exchange ideas where and, and, and where the scientific um, and traditional viewpoints um, are, are also, uh, you know, uh, uh, shared amongst the uh, countries. So that's something uh, that we do uh, we at an effort called the Nadi Festival, which we will again have sometime later this year. And uh, we look forward to uh, engaging with you at that time also. Um, but it's just something that I wanted to mention to you that we, we, we want to do that, actually, because I think, as you very, very correctly pointed out, it's a very much the, <laughs> the need of the hour. More sharings and more exchanges of uh, viewpoints uh, and a common uh, appreciation of each other's points of view based on the scientific evidence, which is common. So, uh, you know, thank you very much for that. And uh, thank you very much for giving you. this opportunity. Yes, thank you. Thank you. I think we're running out of time, so I hand it over to Atre. And uh, I hope that, uh, you know, there'll be questions and we'll be in, in touch with you in the future uh, on such. And, and this video for our viewers will also be available on our Facebook and uh, Facebook and the social media pages uh, for viewing. Those who have missed it watching now, they can watch it also later in our Facebook channels and uh, YouTube channels. So over to you, Atre, and thank you again, Professor Tarek. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And thank you, Professor Tare, for this very informative presentation. Um, sir, we have a few questions that have come from our uh, pages. The first one is, um, what are the challenges that have been faced uh, during the implementation of these plans, like the Namami Gange 1, 2? And how is it that we can work or how is it that we, the policymakers, the stakeholders, public-private partnership, and how can they work towards a avoiding these mistakes in the future initiatives. See, as I said, this is a very, very uh, evolving and dynamic process. Okay. And at any given point of time, uh, one really does not have the luxury of waiting for a long time for all studies to happen, uh, for all processes to get completed. Okay. There is always, uh, you know, uh, timelines uh, of different professionals. The politicians have a timeline. Uh, if they have the clear cut mandate, maybe as per Indian system, maybe five years. Uh, okay, because that's where uh, the government cycle works. Okay, the administrators, uh, if you look at it, uh, these days the highest level administrators, their cycle is only one, one and a half year, maximum two years uh, at the most. The technocrats obviously work for a much longer uh, time in the system. And that's the real challenge that, that we have. But nevertheless, uh, I am only hopeful and with times to come, uh, these long-term studies have to go on. At the same time, some adopt decisions uh, or short-term decisions have to be taken. So some resources are allocated, uh, some actions are taken. Uh, we should look at them in a very, very positive way. Uh, rather than just taking it in the uh, in a very very uh, negative uh, way or so, uh, I'm sure uh, in times to come the improvements do take place. Okay, so like for example, sitting here, uh, you may ask me question that you have done such a study. Is that does the government listen to you? Okay, but I also have to understand and appreciate how the government works how the bureaucracy works, right? And we have to make sure that we do not create two different uh, compartments, but make sure that we, we are constantly on a dialogue. Uh, we keep telling and they also listen to us. So that patience is very, very much necessary. And any river restoration is a long-term thing. If you look at any world river, whether it is Thames River or Murray Darling River or Rhine River or whatever, uh, it has taken 40 years, 50 years or so. And that too, if you understand all aspects, you will see hardly any work has been done in restoration of any of the rivers for that matter. Some aspects may be more advanced in some place, uh, maybe by lacking at some other place. But all of them are going through the same kind of uh, 
process okay and the resources that are required unless until we understand this development and river conservation paradigm together uh, it would be very difficult to have sustainable things so it's very much possible uh, that we can uh, do that uh, and both uh, short term as well as long term studies are required and so also actions yes we will commit some mistakes there is no doubt about it nobody is uh, perfect right and so yes we will but we most important thing is to learn from those mistakes and not repeat uh, the same thing uh, so at given time of time whatever is understanding we take call and actions based on that <laughs> so another question um, is india's culture is strongly built around the rivers our civilizations and everything is built around our rivers but the cso has failed to conserve them so how can we align modern science and tradition to solve the pollution issue as well as any other existing issues that are faced in the basin see that is where as i said we will have to come to a negotiating table and as i said very civil society organization probably uh, takes a very extreme view okay and like for example even in terms of pollution i i face that issue like some uh, civil society organizations will say that the huge expenditure on uh, modern sewage treatment plants and wastewater treatment plants and electromechanical is a waste of thing uh, uh, no river is going to get restored uh, it's unnecessary expenditure or whatever and what they say is that nature will take care of this uh, kind of pollution okay on the other hand uh, the, those who are arguing for uh, advanced sewage treatment they, they think that uh, everywhere very high level stps are but where are the resources going to come from that for that okay so i think both extreme views are not very important uh, are not going to help us okay so we have to make sure that wherever whatever is applicable and this is where i was arguing in a short that we have to have a variable standards we cannot have uniform standards that everywhere the water waste water has to be treated to that level okay or no treatment needs to be given <laughs> to sewage uh, the river our natural systems will take all these extreme arguments are not going to work okay and that's where it is important so sir in this can um people living around the basin uh, contribute uh, towards like their uh, first hand experiences that would uh, help them in uh, help in these policy making so policies to be formulated in a certain way their their views and their opinions about uh, really? their, what problems yeah. they are facing would be something that could be discussed and could be implemented or yeah included yeah, in the surely. in fact that is what we are looking at a river basin organization has to be a bottom up approach right a small river should have its own authority and they should decide what should be done rather than from the top uh, organization telling them what needs to be done okay but coordination has to happen from from the top <coughs> so even a river basin organization has to be a bottom up approach we should have a small local uh, river bodies uh, getting integrated into a bigger river basin bodies and ultimately into the top not just one uh, river basin organization some few technocrats few experts uh, deciding on the entire basin it has to come from uh, bottom to the top and that is where everywhere's participation so even river basin organization also has to be uh, uh, hierarchical from bottom to the top and the local people have to be empowered uh, in, in taking that decision and call thank you sir it was um, it was very nice to hear that <coughs> there can be uh, there can be efforts and all that can be done to improve and to work on a uh, future plans and initiative which will be a little bit more successful than its predecessors but already and, that is happening you must have seen uh, under manrega program or whatever so people are getting even our prime minister mentioned about few rivers being rejuvenated using local efforts i think that's the way to go and as and when it gets multiplied on a very large way in a big way uh, i think we will have a very different situation 
already there is a talk uh, that uh, we will now take up thousand plus rivers together uh, in the next three to four years or so uh, under various schemes and the local people will get engaged in that yes so that would be that would be giving the local people employment and also and be yeah. working towards a mass scale of restoration and rejuvenation of our rivers Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for okay, this so great much. presentation. Yeah. And thank you to our audience for joining us for this lecture. And uh, we hope to be uh, have another session with you, sir, on this topic and on a more enhanced and a more imp uh, with a more positive kind of outcome when we next meet and have another lecture with you, sir. Thank, sure. you. thank, thank you. Thank you, sir. Namaskar. Namaskar, sir.